Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Factory. I'm Heidi from the wisdomfactory.net and for this November 2020 I have um, a repetition of a series I did about two years ago when my husband Mark Davenport died and it was about conscious dying, conscious living, conscious dying, conscious aging, all these things. And November traditionally in Christian culture is the month of death. And so I am doing a new short series about death and dying. And I'm very glad today to talk with Beatrice Martino. And I couldn't say it's conscious aging when, you, when people see you because you are not not old, you are aging, yes, because everybody's aging as soon as they are born, but not aging in this uh, way we are talking about. And it's very strange that you are talking with me about death. And uh, we will go into this topic, but first I would like to ask you to introduce yourself and where you are, what you are doing, and then exactly why you are interested in this topic, okay? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so my name is Beatrice Antoni Martino, and I am uh, a multidisciplinary uh, artist and performer. Um, and I just completed my master's degree at NYU Gallatin School of Individualized Study, where you uh, have the opportunity to build your own curriculum and your own degree program. And so uh, for that, I chose to study uh, contemporary views of death and grief um, in the United States. And I built, because I'm an artist, I built uh, an installation as my final project as a space for uh, grief processing and kind of as an intervention to what I feel like is a kind of a systemic problem, um, at least here in the States, um, of not really having space for grief and being really uncomfortable with the topics of grief and death and people are really um, there's a sense of needing to move on quickly or to pretend like you're okay and you're happy when you're really processing something really major um, so yeah I that's that was what I worked on um, I'm currently in San Diego California um, but I'm based in New York still and um, yeah I'll leave it there for now no, I want you to continue because how come that in your age, I mean, our age, uh, death seems to be a little nearer now. So it's normal that we think about this. But in your age, unless you have a very heavy illness or so, nobody would think about death and dying. So how come that you choose that as a topic? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, when I was uh, 15, well, when I was 14, my, my father got diagnosed with a brain tumor. Um, and with about, within about nine months, um, he died. And um, although we, we had the, the prognosis in mind, um, we were, all three of us were fighting very hard for his life. And um, actually we really, he had a brain, he had, he had brain surgery um, right after the diagnosis and the results came back as benign. So we actually thought we were over the hill and everything was fine. And um, when he finally went back in to get some follow-up scans, they discovered that they had taken um, the adjacent brain tissue and um, the tumor had grown and it was no longer uh, possible to intervene. And so even within the nine months, it was very condensed the time where we were processing the fact that maybe he was actually dying um, and this was the end and we weren't really willing to accept that. So it, it was a lot, it was a very um, emotional and difficult time for our family. And he actually didn't, they wanted to take him to hospice um, for quite a time. And um, he actually didn't go to hospice until the day before he died, um, which was kind of that, that final moment of kind of acceptance, I guess, on his part, um, that that's what was happening. So um, that was a major, loss for me at a very young age. And um, we were a really, really tight knit family, the three of us, um, just a total unit. We went everywhere together, did everything together. When my parents had um, work obligations or work travel or anything like that, I was always tagging along. Um, we were totally all together. So when my father left that equation, 
my mother and I had to kind of fill in the gap together. Um, and I really felt like I had to become a stronghold for her. And I didn't know how to process my emotions. And instead I decided to kind of hide them away and, and be strong on the outside. Um, and, but I also discovered by the time I kind of realized what was going on and I needed to process my emotions, nobody really understood anymore. And nobody in my age understood anyway, but there was, you know, there's that beginning sympathetic nature that people have when someone just dies, you know, the first couple of weeks, the first couple of months. And then at some point people stop checking in on you or caring about it. And I had a delayed reaction, I think, because of the shock and because of my age and because of a lot of things. So I felt very alone and in my experience. And I ended up turning to my art. I mean, I did my first choreography when my dad was sick. Um, and I did a lot of writing. Um, and then over the years, um, pretty much at every major developmental point of my life, I've had a major loss. So uh, freshman year of college, my grandfather died. He had become kind of my ersatz father figure. Um, and then uh, during, right after I graduated college, um, in that period of time, I lost a best friend from high school who was just a year older than myself. Um, and also a mentor and artist uh, who I always called my adopted grandmother because she, basically felt like a grandmother, even though we were not biologically connected. Um, and then um, I got to graduate school. <laughs> um, and in the winter break of my first semester, my grandmother died. I was there for, for the last month of her life to caretake. Um, and then actually, as I finished my thesis, I was, I was two days before submission of my final thesis and a very dear friend of ours died. So it's... <laughs> It's very strange. I, I don't think it's a coincidence. It's something, I don't know, these losses have occurred at these very specific moments in my life and they've all impacted me and um, in different ways. And I don't know, I feel like it's my calling and my life's purpose to be a grief activist and to talk about these subjects that don't people don't want to talk about. and. I know it's strange to like at a young age to have that kind of conviction, but I, I do think that the things that happen in our life happen towards a purpose and, and we kind of craft how, how we're supposed to be in the world based on, you know, the things that we experience. Um, so yeah, I've felt very alienated in my own grief. I have a very hard time processing my own grief. Um, I often turn to my artistic practice and that has been a great savior to me. Um, but I don't wanna see other people feeling it the way that I have felt it, feeling alone. And I know we're not alone. And so many people experience grief. I mean, right now we're in a pandemic, we're all experiencing grief, um, even if it's not related to death. So I, I think it's really important to have these conversations and to make space for it. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm doing these conversations about death and dying. So as I understand, you have also experienced the fact that if a person dies who is very near to you, then people, yeah, they come to the funeral, say good, nice words, and maybe one week or two, they still think about it and then they forgot about you, forget about you, don't even ask how you are after a month or two or even after half a year. It is as if you are supposed to have to be normal again, you know, why, oh, just, why do you still hang there, you know, it's in, inimaginable. So uh, I had the same experience and I talked with um, other women who have lost her, their husbands or their partners. And it's the same thing that people expect also on the workplace that after a week or two, that's like being sick from the influenza or something, you know, and then you come back and it's everything like before. And when you go through this process, you know, that's not, and people are left alone. And so my, uh, my idea was by doing these things public to inspire people to let them know that they are not alone and that it's not, it's not normal that there is nobody taking care. 
that's something strange in our society. And I know you have worked about that. So shall we go into this or do you want me to tell me first a little bit more about your first non-existing grief process or, or a little bit more about how, how you, how was it for you the, the, when the first weeks, for instance, how was it? Yeah, um, I mean, I want to respond to what you said first, which is, is that's one of the things that I write about um, and critique in my thesis is how there's this sense that there's a timeline and that it's linear. And even the idea, um, I'm sure you've heard of uh, the Kubler-Ross model of the stages of grief. Um, you know, people have misinterpreted that as linear stages and then once you check all the boxes you're done and then you go on with your life and and that's just not it's not the experience at all and and even you know originally when Kubler-Ross created that model it wasn't meant to be linear it was more uh, a model of acknowledging that grief is complicated and grief is multi-layered and you can have all kinds of different emotions not just sadness not just regret you know that also anger and also sometimes joy and sometimes acceptance and you are okay and then the next minute you're not you know it's it's tumultuous and ever-changing and so that's one of the things that i um am fighting against and also trying to expose and um challenge um to say grief is messy Grief is ongoing, grief is cyclical. I mean, also like anniversaries and um, as you have another loss, I mean, every time I've experienced a different loss, it also kind of triggers the feelings of the first loss or the second loss, you know, it's, it's all interconnected. It's not a linear process. So that's, yeah, that <laughs> is very much what I'm thinking about. Um, but yeah, my first grief experience, I, I don't know, it's hard for me to remember exactly what it was like right when my father died. I think mostly I was in shock. I went to school the next day. Um, I didn't know what else to do really. I, 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 didn't, I wasn't prepared at all. And I think partially because I was young, also partially because we hadn't accepted the reality as a family. Um, we were fighting. We believed that my father could make it through you know that he was that it was going to be a miracle something was going to happen we were so convinced by that and had this hope even as things were deteriorating so it didn't feel real to me um but i think also i mean that makes me think about um the rituals around death i, I there's many beautiful rituals of the washing of the body or being present with the body or having some kind of, you know, prayers or something, you know, right when someone dies um, before the body gets taken away. And even a lot of that is gone from our culture. Um, and I think that makes it harder to integrate and internalize the reality of the death um, because I think it's really important for us to have an embodied engagement with it. And when someone's body just vanishes, it's it's so much harder to then process that they're gone. It's just this, like, it's such a jolt. Yeah. Um, I so. can say something to that because my father died and I was there in the last month with him. I was 27. And, um, but at the moment of his death, I was doing a singing course in another city and I came home and he was dead and I didn't see him anymore. And even at the funeral, I didn't see him anymore. And then what happened to me for almost 20 years, I thought, okay, he, we, are, we just don't see each other. You know, he is in holiday or I'm in holiday or something like this. I, I held up this strange idea of uh, nothing has happened because I obviously couldn't um, make it to, to accept the, the death, you know, also I, I knew he was dead and I said he was dead and something, but in myself, I didn't. And it took me quite a while then when I realized that to go through the grief at the end, you know, I still have written a text, which I uh, observation impressions of death 
which I wrote then. And I, I took it out only a few, few days ago. I have read it half. But you know, in, in the moment, I was aware of the precious moment, of the sacredness of the moment. But then, for a long time, no, 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 in a box far away, and it's not real. Yeah, but now it has changed this, <laughs> this attitude, thankfully. Yeah. Well, and one thing. Uh, muted. Yeah, muted. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I I can relate to that too. I mean, so I've had this series of deaths, and um, it's interesting. I haven't thought about it this directly, but it's totally true that the ones that I feel like I've been able to grieve the most and process and continue to process um, are my father and then now my grandmother. And those of all of the deaths that I've experienced, those were the two where I actually got to be present with the body. With my father, I came uh, about 10 minutes after he died. So I wasn't there for the actual moment, but I was there with the body, even if it was only briefly. And with my grandmother, I was actually present. I was lying on the bed with her um, when, she, when she died. Um, and it's interesting, I've had a really hard time processing my grandfather's death and my mentor's death and my friend um, because yeah, I wasn't, those were all things where I got news later and then there was some kind of funeral or something, but, but also with my grandfather, I'd just gone away to college and I wasn't used to seeing him every day anymore. And I was just planning, I would see him when I came back. And so every time I came back to San Diego, even though I knew he was gone, I kept thinking I would turn a corner in the house and there he'd be, or yeah, it's, it was really strange. It was, it was such a hard disconnect for me. Um, so I think there's something to that. Um, and it makes me think of everyone who's losing people right now um, with COVID and not being able to say goodbye and not being able to be present with the body and how hard my heart absolutely breaks for what people are going through right now because it's, we can't even gather for funerals. Like you, you, you're, we're losing all of it, not just the presence with the body and kind of those last moments, but also the, the beautiful gathering that happens right after. Um, so that's, yeah, I'm, I've been trying to think of ways to, um, well, other people are also thinking of this, but how, how can we find ways for digital rituals? How can we find ways to honor the people who have died, even if we couldn't be there or can't gather? Um, what are some alternatives to what we're used to? For me, it seems like the, the highest point of a development where death was excluded from life. And so now that we have even to do it digitally, digitally to see the death body, if we want to see it, that is, to me it seems to be really absurd, I have to say. And also that children are shel sheltered from seeing their death uh, grandparents and stuff. That leads to yeah, we are talking in Women Matters in the series about shadow that leads to something which is buried in the consciousness of the people and they carry it around all the time because they never could close the circle of, of, of life, you know, which, or of experience which they had with this uh, person. And I think it's very unhealthy development in our culture, you know. Can you say more about that, about more of these strange things which we are getting, have been getting in? Yeah, so part of my research for my thesis was looking at, um, there's a, a historian, uh, Philippe Ariès, he's French, and he wrote a book called The Western Attitudes Towards Death and Dying. Um, and he's looking kind of at the, the European history, but then also how that kind of comes over to the United States. Um, and it's kind of, it's a historical overview from the Middle Ages to, well, to the present, which in his time was the 70s. Um, but it really struck me because he talks about how in the Middle Ages and kind of historically how everything was so interconnected and um, when someone was dying, the entire village was in the room and the children were running around and people were playing games and talking and it was this, everything was interconnected. Um, and even cemeteries, you know, that those were the gathering places. It wasn't this like separate, scary entity, but people would have parties in cemeteries or picnics, you know, it's, 
there was this interconnectedness between life and death and it all kind of went together and there was this collective idea that we we're all part of a greater whole and when someone dies it impacts everyone else and we have to come together in that way and have these rituals around it to um and it's expected too like people acknowledge that death was real and would happen right and now i think i mean a lot of it has to do with global warfare and the medical system and um kind of the individualized cultures where you know we're no longer thinking so much about the collective it's all about individual um and and also the separation of families that families no longer live in the same area you know there's so many different components i think that have led to where we are now um in particular like the medical piece i i think about that a lot because death is seen as failure of the medical team you know even if the death was supposed to happen it's really inevitable and it's natural and all of that there's still this idea that there's some medical you know miracle or thing that could have prevented it and so i think there's already this idea that we're we want to be immortal and we don't want to accept that death is actually um a possibility or real even though it happens all the time um and i think that makes us not engage with it in a healthy way yeah um, i can share a story when uh, one of a former partner was about to die in the hospital he had a stroke and i really when i saw him i realized he would be you know he was like like this and couldn't talk anymore and uh, and so on and i saw in his eyes and his behavior that he was had pain and i asked um, the the nurses to give him something for the pain and they said oh he could be become dependent i said what are you crazy you see the state of the person you don't want to give them morphium or whatever it is for fear that they get addicted come on and then i really had to 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 talk with the, also with the doctor and i didn't have the authority but fortunately the the chil his children were on the same line and uh, while his partner she said oh what is happening to me and, da, 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 da. and they treated him only because he couldn't speak anymore like a piece of I, I don't know what you know the nurses came and touched him and everything and oh, he, i saw him uh, shiver because of he couldn't realize what was going on so in the time i went there every day for four, four hours or so for to exchange with the with the children you know the, that there is every time somebody there and I started to tell him, uh, I said, now the nurse is coming and they will do this and this and that. And so keep when hold, held his hand so he could keep quiet because they think they even talk things in which you shouldn't talk in front of a, 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 a ill person, but they think when they don't talk, so they don't understand, but he did understand. And the thing was also, I told him, uh, when we lived together, he always said, if you have a problem and you can resolve it, so why, why would you be uh, crying, you know? And if you have a problem and you cannot solve it, why would you be crying? So, you know, that was his philosophy. And when he was there in the hospital the last few days, I told him, you know, you have now, we are in this situation and you always said uh, that when, when, the, when the situation is in a certain way, why you tr should you be crying? Uh, but in this case, you cannot resolve it. That's the one you cannot resolve. So uh, I reminded him about his, um, his decision in some way, you know, that um, either you can resolve it or not. And I made clear to him that he couldn't resolve it. And I think that led to the fact that the doctor said the blood uh, numbers, it was all all right, it's all wonderful, you know, but he died the next day. So it couldn't, it couldn't be. But fortunately he died because that was the day uh, when his daughter had arranged to bring him to Rome about uh, 70, 80 kilometers into a hospice. And he, I think he decided he wouldn't stay in this way. And he, he, he chose to die. And I said, 
to myself because I didn't see him when he was dead. Uh, I said, good, well done, well done, because that was exactly his character. But what I found so horrible that the caring people didn't care. They did all what they do, what they need to do, but they were not aware of the anxiousness, of the fear, of the emotional state of the patient. Just, you know, it was, for me, it was cruel. <laughs> I'm sorry, but the, the good thing is, I do think that at the end, we have the possibility to choose to go, you know, or to stay, depends on, what we, what we want to stay, you know, there are many near-death experiences. I don't know, did you study that in your, in your thesis also, that people come back? I didn't, I didn't look at that directly, but I have some responses to what you're sharing, um, which one is uh, what you're describing about the hospital is, is what Arias calls um, hospitals, death and dying factories and that it is institutionalized and also it's it's where death occurs death doesn't occur at home as much anymore um which is where it used to happen when in community right um and and the factory idea too i think that that kind of impersonal just kind of get through the charts get through the next person get get on with it um it's it is it's it's heartbreaking and it's awful and you know the term even withdrawal of care when when they decide to take someone off machines it's called withdrawal of care and i read an article about that about the language we use that when we say withdrawal of care what are we really saying we're saying we're not caring for this person anymore we're not you know it's anyway so there's a, there's a lot there um but i also want to say it, it it's you know of course we can't know for sure because we haven't you know we can't interview someone who has died <laughs> but um but all the, a lot of people who work in the end of life field and have been around death a lot notice that there really does seem to be, especially with kind of natural deaths or deaths at the end of a long illness, you know, deaths that we know are going to happen, um, that the dying person really kind of does have that, has a choice at, at when, when to give, not give up, but when to have that final moment. Um, there's so many stories of a certain family member walks out of the room or a certain family member walks into the room or a certain holiday passes or whatever. There's these circumstances and it, and it happens too frequently um, to say that it it's coincidental or that there isn't a choice. Of course, again, like I said, we can't interview someone who's died to say, oh, did you make that decision? But it, it seems that that's the case, that that um, there's a, there's that ounce of there's still that ounce of control at the end and there's the choice to release that final release. Um, mm. I know my grandmother did it. She, um, her birthday was right around, she loved holidays. She loved Christmas. So she stuck around through Christmas and new year's and her birthday was January 3rd and she died on the 5th. So she stuck and she had a big, she had a party, had a bunch of people over on the third and she was very ill the day before and the day after, but she, her birthday was great. <laughs> And then on the fifth, you know, she she gotten to do all of the holidays. She got to celebrate her birthday, um, and there were a lot of people coming and going in the house. Um, and she, um, and also she was in at this this recliner chair um, for the last month or so of her life um, because it was easier for her to sleep in and get up from and things like that. But we wanted to move her to a bed and she resisted and resisted and resisted for um, weeks and weeks and weeks. And then on the day, on the day that she died, she, she finally, she worked with us and a couple of other people and it was a big, hard process because she was very weak at that point to get out of the recliner chair and get over to the bedroom and to be in the bed and um, and then all the people, all the helpers and everybody left the house. It was just my mother and I in the room with her and we were singing to her and talking to her. And she asked us earlier that evening if we were gonna stay the night. And we said, yes. And she said, oh, good. And, and then I was lying next to her on the bed and I, you know, she was on oxygen. So we, we don't actually know exactly the moment. There was just some moment where we realized that she wasn't breathing anymore, it was just the oxygen machine. But I was lying next to her and we were just talking to her and singing to her and it was the three of us in the room. 
Um, and it really feels like she waited. She waited. She made that effort at the end to make sure she was in a bed. She waited to make sure she had all the holidays. She waited till everyone else left the house. Um, and she made sure that we were going to be there. She asked us if we were going to be there. And then I think those were, you know, those were the things that she needed to know. And then she was ready to, to let go. Um, so yeah, I think there's something that's a real thing. And I've talked to death doulas and end of life, you know, people and, and a lot of people who see death constantly as part of their career. It's the same thing. And I heard that from so, um, I mean, I read about it, I didn't hear it directly, but that it happens often, that um, people wait until the person who needs to come, comes actually, like uh, children also. And also when Mark died, my husband, no, he, I think it's not a decision which you make consciously. It, I, I think it's more a decision of your soul. The soul makes it. So when he died, he still could get up with a difficulty with an oxygen machine and we went out to a sofa and he was sitting there. I did still some things, uh, took some medicines in the morning and he told me, he said, you have done a whole lot for me or you, you, you have given me a lot. And I said, you too. But you know, I was busy around. And then we were sitting outside and a friend came because they had understood that it was the time friend, maybe our best friend, yeah, he came and we were talking and we we're sitting around. And then he had a, a, an urge to, 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 to make pee pee, let's say, you know, and that was always difficult with a, with a, an oxygen um, thing and so on. And then he had an attack of uh, breathlessness and I ran for the uh, emergency medication and I I didn't I was so so whoop, I didn't really make it to give it to him and so the friend did it and the friend before had told about his brother who was about to die and Mark himself he he said you know my brother had emphysema and when I asked him nobody asked him he said about this but I asked him one day and said don't you fear to die and he said no, I don't fear to die. I only fear to run out of breath. And then he said, and you know what? Now I'm, I'm in the same con uh, situation, he said. And then this breathlessness attack arrived. And then he was still sitting and they fell, he fell over and was dead. So I do think also that he decided to use this moment because I was not alone so that somebody was around. And also he could have gone on to, to having to stay in bed all the time and, you know, and it could have been worse, 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 worse. And I think he was really caring and doing the best for both of us. I almost cry when I say that, you know, it's, it's really, I do think that people have the ability to choose or their souls, you know, so yeah. And we should trust in that. And he had done a peace with this, I, I'm quite sure, because the, about the last 10 days he had these eyes, which were looking like transparent, like as if they see already something else. We still talked normally, but he often looked at me and it was almost embarrassing because with these eyes, somebody looking at you, you know, <gasps> yeah, but at the other, and it was beautiful, you know, when I look back to that, that he, he also appreciated very much life in his last months. Although he didn't know at this point that he was about to die, you know, he was ever more, how can you say sentimental? It's maybe not the right word, sensitive towards uh, what life means and what gift uh, life is. And so maybe, maybe we can, help people to realize why they are still alive, to appreciate what they are. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm working with an organization called Reimagine End of Life, and they organize these festivals. They used to be in person, now they're online, um, talking about exactly these topics. And their whole kind of mission statement and idea is that if we face death 
and we face these hard topics and face the reality of all of this, that we actually are going to live more fully. That, um, I mean, I think it, it, it's, it's hard to hold on to it, I think. Sometimes I think we have to be reminded all the time, but I do know that, you know, in the immediate aftermath of a loss or maybe around an anniversary or any moments when the grief feels particularly potent, I, I am much more grateful and I'm much more aware of the things that I find beautiful and important. And I care less about the silly and, you know, the superficial things that are worrying me. I care less about the problems. I think more about the people I care about. I don't know. There is something that shifts in the way that I exist when I'm present with the reality of death or loss or thinking about, about that. And I think that's really beautiful. And if we can hold on to that, you know, we can live more fully in our lives. But I think it's also true. It's, it's the people who are dying are, have the best wisdom, <laughs> you know, they, there's, there's something I think, I mean, I, and I can't speak to that because I've never had a terminal illness and I'm not dying. Um, but, but I, I think there is something really profound about that soul knowledge, even if it's not conscious knowledge, even if there's not a diagnosis, I think, even there's, there's some kind of thing ahead of time where the soul knows the timeline is ending soon and suddenly the person starts behaving a little bit differently and seeing things differently and engaging differently um, and yeah those eyes my father had the same eyes at the end um i don't know if my grandmother did i think she she was interesting she it was always someone who needed to be in control. And I think even the bed thing, it was like her decision when she went to the bed. There was, in my mind, her whole, the end time for her was all about those last moments of control. <laughs> it was a very, yeah, it was a different kind of experience. I mean, I think she was ready to release by the end. It was, she was very gentle and sweet at the end and she was, could be quite feisty. <laughs> so, so there definitely was a shift in her demeanor. Um, the last day but but I think for her it was about control and and a, like her independence and her choice I think that was a big big part for her a lot of people were trying to tell her how to take care of the illness how to everything people were trying left right and center were trying to tell her to have caretakers or not have caretakers to go here or do this or do that and yeah, I think it was really important for her to be true to herself to the end. So that was the impression I got from her last days. But yeah, it's death is beautiful. And it's I mean, it's hard. It's hard to talk about it. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm definitely you know, I feel <laughs> the adrenaline in my body. And you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, to talk about it. But I think it's also really, it's life giving, which maybe is feels counterintuitive, but I feel like death is really life-giving. Yeah, and I wanted to, to talk about another topic which you brought up just now. People who know everything better, who give you advice when you are ill, who give you advice, I mean, I'm guilty of that too, I do that too, no? But uh, when, when with death and with grief, they say, oh, get over it, or is, as you said to your grandmother, say you have to have a care, uh, somebody else. What do you think about that? And how should people be have, behave for the benefit of the ones who have the loss or who are dying? Um, uh, what would be the best behavior instead of feeling either obliged to know what is best for them or to feel really like, oh, I know everything and I have to tell you and you don't know anything. So how can, can people manage in these cases? Because the other uh, option is to not say anything, which we don't want either, that uh, people don't talk with us, you know, when we are in grief or if we are ill and pretend that nothing is, is on. So how can people behave, in your opinion? Yeah, I've noticed that too. And I think, I think it's fear-based. I think it's, it's the same thing like when someone dies and the first question someone asks is, 
how old were they? How close were you? How did it happen? You know, this is like barrage of, of interrogation of these facts to kind of, for the person who's asking, I think it's for their comfort to kind of wrap their head around the reality of death rather than actually being present for the person who just experienced the loss. I mean, it's exhausting. I'm sure you are familiar with this too. It's exhausting to have to go through that litany over and over and over again. Um, and also feel like, especially the question, how close were you to me always feels like a judgment of, oh, okay, you're not going to grieve as much or you are, or, you know, it's, it's a very strange uh, piece. And I think it's, yeah, it's, it comes from the fear and discomfort around death, but I think people feel like they need to step in and give advice and ask these kinds of questions. Um, and I really think, and, and, and there's not, you know, unfortunately, there's not any guidelines or rituals right now, you know, in contemporary culture as, as to how we should behave beyond these kind of cliches. Um, but I strongly believe in the idea of um, holding space. I mean, that's what it's called in a lot of different uh, fields, but the idea of being pre fully present with the person wherever they are and trusting that they, they actually know what they need, whether it's the dying person or the person who is grieving, I think the most powerful thing you can do is to be fully present and be a container and maybe sometimes it's about asking certain kinds of questions or just sharing your own experience, but not, not trying to put them in any particular box or, or force them to do anything or judge that they're supposed to be doing things in a certain way, but rather hold the container for them to have the experience and have the experience not alone. So I think like a, our friend who he just lost his partner in July, that was the one that I mentioned when I was finishing my thesis. Um, and he has, oh, I think you, you heard him, he, he played uh, the oboe in our, our vigil. Um, and he, I, f I think it's been so helpful for him, the times that we've been on the phone, even, you know, we're actually working on some business things together. And even on those calls, every once in a while, he just needs to share something about how he's been processing the loss of Ken and and what the what yesterday was like when he was going through documents or whatever you know whatever's coming up for him and i think and he knows also i think because he knows i studied this and because i i knew ken and i love ken and i've you know i was one of the first people to call him when i found when ken died um i think he knows he can do that with me and and i just i i give him the space and i let him talk say whatever it is he needs to say and and there's no judgment and no um expectation and um you know sometimes I'll, I'll share how i felt a similar thing or i'll just thank him for sharing or thank him for the courage or something like that but um yeah i think deep down even though when you're grieving i think sometimes it feels like you don't know you don't know what you need or what you need to do or if you're dying you know it seems like maybe they don't know i think there's something it's that soul thing we we're talking about i think deep down all you, you need love and support and the space to express. And I think everybody's going to work it out a little bit differently. And some people need to go right back to work and some people need to cry <laughs> for hours and hours and hours. And some people need to be hugged and some people need whatever, you know, it's, it's not, no one does it the same. And I think that's the problem with these reactions is they're expecting every person to respond the same way. And then what ends up happening is, is you clam up, you don't share because mm -hmm. it, it feels like someone else is encroaching on you or telling you how to do it, then you're not going to share what you need to share. And then maybe you never get to share what you need to share. And then you're holding it on for years and it, you know, it's yeah. So that's holding space. That's, that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I fully agree. And holding space, I want to, to try to unpack that a little bit. Holding space is listening. And even if the other person doesn't say anything, emanate the energy of welcoming in some way. You know, and you don't have to say anything particular. What I find is 
some people need a little bit of some question or a little bit of some, but you have to feel your, your way into it. You know, you, it's not so that you have a, a manual, first question this, second question this, but you have to see what is the situation. And you see that, uh, for instance, I make it up now out, out of the moment that the person is about to cry, you can acknowledge this. You can say, yeah, it's hard. I can see that it's, it's very difficult for you. And so let them the space and maybe they tell you then what, you can also ask very cautiously how they feel, how they, it feels inside. And, and, you know, without, as you say, without, it's very difficult, this communication, actually, but you can make it. If you really care for the person, you will make it and you will take the time to figure out what's the right way to support them. And not by telling them, uh, you should take somebody. <laughs> <laughs> from outside or something. No good advice. Uh, advice, I think, in these occasions are never good. So just listening, listening in a very deep level. And you can share your own experience, but not for sharing, oh, for me it was like this, blah, 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 blah. A little bit like I did before, you know, <laughs> but you are not dying, fortunately. <laughs> it, it must happen on a much deeper level, level when you share your experience, you know, only for to have the other person gently understand that they are not alone, that other people share this experience. And so they can, in your case, if you are the one sharing, that you can really relate to what the other person is going through. And I think this is helping. I really didn't have that so much. I had it online with people, but not <laughs> Not really in person, you know. So when I did my the, the shows with the people I invited, that was very deep, and also our other conversations which we have there, it happens. But in real life, it seems to be so 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 difficult. So uh, what is your your next step then? When you have done now the the um, the thesis, how will you proceed with this project? That's the big question. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I would just want to respond quickly first to what you're just saying that um, the sharing, if you're sharing, it has to be sharing for them. It's not sharing for you. I think that's the key. It's um, when you're holding space for the person who's going through this, it, it has to be all about them and about their experience. And you are just present with them. And sometimes that means present with them you know, putting the groceries away or just doing regular life things. And sometimes that's listening to them share a story. But yeah, I think that it has to be about that person. And then if you're sharing, sharing with the intention of what is it giving to them, I think it's going to be the right amount of sharing with the right energy. But if it's sharing because suddenly their loss reminded you that you have something you need to process, <laughs> then you're, you're asking them to do a lot of work too, which is not what they need. Um, so that's, I just wanted to add that, but yeah, what's next? Um, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm working on, on a couple of projects right now. Um, I, I'm working with the Reimagined Festival. Um, I'm going to be hosting an event around gratitude around Thanksgiving, um, to give people space to, well, at least here in the States, Thanksgiving is, you know, it's definitely a very family time. And I think right now, because of distancing, but also because of losses, um, people are not going to have a chance to be together. And it might be a very difficult uh, time uh, to be thinking about family and thinking about loss and all of that. So um, I want to kind of intervene <laughs> and see if I can uh, make something positive and beautiful out of that and create a community, digital community. So that's something I'm working on uh, for November. Um, and I mean, in general, I'm, I'm in conversation with a lot of people who are doing work around these things. And I definitely, um, my installation unfortunately got closed down. It was open the day before the COVID shutdowns happened. Um, so only a few people got to see it. I got to document it, but it, I didn't get to have it um, up for people to experience. And so I definitely am thinking about um, probably next year when really things can open up again, but I'd love to 
remount um, that show or to do some portion of it safely, um, thinking about COVID precautions and what spaces are available right now. But um, yeah, I wanna keep making art about these topics. I wanna keep talking about them. Um, I, I'm at a bit of a crossroads because I think I have a lot of options. I've been thinking about PhD programs. I've been thinking about getting an MFA because I, it was an MA, which was a more academically focused, I did an artistic project, but my, my artistic background is actually in performance and not in visual arts. And this installation was very visual, visual. So I was thinking, you know, what if I did a formal visual arts training? Um, but I also have a bachelor's in psychology and I've thought for a long time about counseling and therapy. I've thought about being an end of life doula. There's a lot of, <laughs> There's a lot of lot of things swirling, and I think I think it'll it'll fall into place. Um, I definitely know that whatever I do, I want it to be to hold space, basically hold space around these topics, to create art around these things, to be there for people who are grieving and dying, um, and if nothing else, to to bring awareness to this topic, to yeah, give others the opportunity to think about it and talk about it. Um, so. Yes, to be determined. <laughs> um, things are in the works, but um, it's also a, a strange time to be, you know, essentially starting a career because um, I just, you know, finished my degree um, and everything is in flux, as you know, with the pandemic. So, um, but I do have yeah. a last personal question. How do you think all that, what you have done, has advanced your own grieving process? Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely, uh, there's definitely a kind of physician heal thyself thing going on here. Um, I mean, as I said before, I always turn to my artistic practice for my own processing. And I think um, when I was building this installation, I initially planned for it to be completely disconnected from my own story um, to only make a space for other people. Um, but it turned out that I kept hitting roadblocks with that. I couldn't figure out how to do that. And, and I realized that actually my story was a big part of it and I needed to have some of my story and myself in the space. And actually that, like we were saying just now, the sharing, sometimes the sharing of your story is very helpful for someone because it is that indication that you're not alone. And the, my whole idea for the installation was for people to not feel like they're alone. So, um, I ended up putting putting pieces of my own story into the installation. And I think that that actually um, gave it a lot of resonance and power and it was really beautiful. And it was, it was processing for me. I mean, one of the pieces I made was um, a notebook. So I do, I do video projection art and I videoed myself writing in the notebook the last phrases that my grandmother said before she died the last week or so, because I had recorded those. Um, and I wrote them out by hand in the notebook. And then after writing the phrases, I would write the date that she said them. And then I wrote six days before she died or four days before she died or something like that. Um, and then I uh, projected that back into the notebook. So it was one of the pieces in the installation where you saw this notebook of this kind of disembodied hand writing these notes. And for me, even when I videotaped that and I installed it, it was I felt very connected to my grandmother and that for me was a processing of the grief of of handwriting her words hearing her saying them you know in my mind's eye mind's ear i guess <laughs> um so there's been a lot of that for me as well um and then the other piece of that is i was there for the last month of my grandmother's life and that was right after my first semester of grad school when i had been studying all of this and I knew, I knew what to expect. And I think I was able to be much more present with her and give her that space and do the things that she felt like she needed and not push her on the things that other people were pushing her on um, in a way that I don't think I could have if I hadn't been actively studying and thinking about these things. So for me, while it was hard, any, any caretaking is really hard. It was a hard month. It was also really beautiful and fulfilling and I knew she was going to die the day that she died. I, I woke up, my phone was on silent and I woke up 
and I looked at my phone and one minute later the nurse called that she thought we should come over. Um, and that was the beginning of the last day of her life. Um, but I, yeah, I knew, I don't know. And, but I think it's because I knew what signs to look for and I was ready to engage. So yeah, that's, those are my, <laughs> maybe a bit long winded answers, but it's definitely, this whole process has definitely had a big impact on my own personal engagement with dying and my own grief. Yeah, wonderful. And what I'm hearing you say is the more you know about death and the process of death, the more you can be helpful to people who are actually dying and the more you can even be living yourself the sacredness in some way, I would say. And also, also it is very hard, but it is an experience which is really worthwhile having for your own life and also you know it's it's just incredible like you say you knew that she would be dying and then when 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 you are together with the body and all these things you know they are you cannot do that virtually let's say in this way and you better do it in when you have the chance take the chance i would say to the people who are listening and watching really um it's amazing experience difficult but it you come out enriched completely enriched beatrice wonderful yeah <laughs> you say your last word <laughs> Go ahead. yeah thank you so much no i was just gonna say it's even now after all of this i think the next i don't want to experience another death but the next death i experience i think <laughs> it'll be even more that you know i think like I've been thinking about the ritual of washing the body. I've never gotten to do that, but I think I want to do that next time. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a growing process and, and it is, it's so enriching and beautiful. So thank you for having me. Thank you for asking these questions and for holding space for me and allowing me to hold space for you and everyone who's listening. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm so glad that you are doing the work you are doing because it is badly needed in our society. And even more so in this very moment and i hope people can get something out of our conversation so thank you very 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 much <laughs> bye bye